So my name is uh, Balaji uh, Siva. I work on this open source project uh, uh, called Conti. And today, I'm going to spend some time talking about some of the use cases that I see that you know, I've talked to the customer for the last year and a half now on this topic. And you know, there are a lot of use cases that come in. And I want to basically go through some of the use cases that we try to solve with this one. Um, so before we get started, um, how many people are deploying containers in production? OK, so keep your hands up. And how many people are deploying more than 20 servers? OK, that's good. OK, so you know, hopefully, you know, as, as you start deploying containers in production, you, know, you would have some requirements that come out based on your application that you're running. And you're going to see, hopefully, some of the things that I'm going to talk about today hopefully resonates with you. I know that going to production is not just about infrastructure for in this particular case, I'm obviously with Cisco. I, I, my I tilt toward this conversation is around infrastructure. It's about people and process, right? I think I've been, I was, I was uh, having a conversation yesterday over drinks, you know, and, and many of the people to adopt can, Dockers, it's not just about whether the infrastructure is ready or not. That's the last thing people worry about. It's like, how do the developers even get onboarded, right? Once you start, it's not like server virtualization where you're able to take an application and just put on a VM and you're done. Containers, once you start breaking it up into microservices, now you're bringing all the developers you know, have, to, have to get on board. And then now, once you start doing that, you need to have the IT processes behind it. So there's a lot of complexity just uh, by, by, by trying to go to containers in production. And so today, I'm going to talk about like, what are the other sort of requirements that you want to think about as you start deploying containers in production. If it works, that'll be great. Not I'll do this here. OK. So my topic is about uh, three, three, three subsections here. One is sort of the requirements part of it, um, you know, what, what I've seen from talking to customers over the past year and a half, and then also the, the actual open source project that I will talk about, which is called the Conti. Um, and then uh, Ken Owens, who will come from our cloud uh, engineering team, he has some ideas around what strategies uh, customers should adopt as they look at cloud native applications. So it's hopefully it's an interesting topic for you as well. So let's get started with the requirements. So as you deploy containers, you know, this, this road in uh, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, kind of reminds me of how the world is today. You know, essentially, you can obviously you know, get through this intersection, but then there is no guarantee that you're going to get through it or not run over by people or run over by cars or trucks or something. Right? So essentially, you, know, you need to try to define applications today. Um, you, know, you use Docker Compose, and you saw some newer things like Adab and all those things they talked about. But then there's no way to specify uh, ambulance should probably go through here first, or people should be, you know, pedestrians should have some uh, right away or something. There's no way to say it. And same with Docker Compose and some of these technologies out there. Not just Docker, I'm just saying the general industry trends, right? Um, there's no way to define different application requirements. And I'll talk about some of the requirements, what, that, what I mean by that in a second. And, and so that's what we are trying to figure out. Like, is there, and obviously we think that as you start deploying in production, you will run into these kind of problems. If there's no roads on the car, of course, you can get through this intersection just fine. But you start deploying you know, hundreds of containers, you, you want to know about some of the other requirements. So, so the, the general premise of this whole topic, and, and I'm happy to hear feedback you know, either here or in the booth that we have in the show floor. You know, what are the requirements um, that you have as you go to production? Right? So one of, the, one of the first requirements that I see coming up, people coming to me, is that I have different types of application with different types of requirements, either networking requirements or storage requirements, or you know, I need a persistent storage, I need a security, I need a, maybe I don't need as much as bandwidth because it's a development app, it's not a production app. These requirements are fairly important. You need to be able to run these applications. If you're running in a shared infrastructure, you need to be able to, able to guarantee that. It's not just like, yeah, hope it works. That's, that's nice for sort of development settings. But in a production, you want to really make sure that it works. And so that is, for me, is one of the important points, is like, how do you differentiate applications as it get deployed? You use Docker Compose and you deploy. How do you differentiate a production uh, application from a development application? How do you do that? So that's sort of the crux of the whole, whole topic we're talking about. The other thing that people talk about, OK, I want to guarantee a performance. Let's say they, they deploy a the couple of containers here. One is a developer app, another is a production app. And it's working just fine because the production app is able to get you know, the 76%, 72% of the traffic. Now, somebody goes in and you know, Swarm basically puts another container on, the, on that particular same server. Now, it starts hogging up the bandwidth. 
So the bandwidth of the production app, for example, goes down. How do you prevent that? How do you prevent such things from happening, basically the noisy neighbor problems? So you need to be able to not only do it at the, you know, okay, the, 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 the CPU is fine, the, uh, the, uh, the IO is performance is fine for now, today, but then tomorrow somebody deploys something uh, on the same cluster, how do you prevent that kind of problems? The other part is, is sort of the, you know, what I see most likely happening is that there are mixed mode applications, meaning you're not doing end-to-end -end container uh, of the application, right? You know, you have multiple tiers, and then you have an end-to-end, -end. you're not doing containers end-to-end. -end. Now, how do you manage that? You have app web tier may be containerized, but then app or database is still in bare metal or VM. You really need an ability to be, um, because the application doesn't change, the application is still the same application, just you change the form factor of the, some of the tier. Uh, so you need to be able to do um, as a sort of policy or end-to-end -end, uh, uh, management of this application. The other part is connectivity, right? I know that um, you know, uh, connectivity is sort of things that people really, I mean, I've, we have seen customers come over to our booth and talk, talk about port conflicts on, on the VMs because you're trying to map, uh, you know, like a, a internal port of the, port of the container to, to actual host port, but if you have multiple containers using similar ports, you're gonna have port conflicts. How do you reach the uh, microservice from anywhere from the, uh, from the other application, maybe uh, bare metal or some other application needs a microservice and it is a container, how do you reach it in a consistent fashion? So you really need a, a way to connect these containers, these microservices from anywhere and have the flexibility um, to be able to do that. So, you know, for, for networking audience in, the, in, the, in this case, you may, you may have a layer two network or VLAN based network, or you may have a layer three network or sort of IP router network. Um, or you may want to say, you know, I want to do overlays or sort of like, you know, basically tunnel basically traffic across the different servers. You want to be able to specify that depending on your situation. You don't want to go back and say to your IT provider, listen, I want to run this application. You better turn everything uh, into this model of networking or something. So you're not going to get that answer. So you, you want to be able to fit into what's available, either in a private cloud setting or a public cloud setting. The other piece is sort of the uh, ability to uh, provide security for the microservices. You don't have to create a subnet or you know, a network for every microservice you create. You may have one flat network, one big network, and then you, you still want to be able to provide security for the containers in that network. Right? So let's say you have, a, you have a slash 24 or 256 you know, address space, and then you start putting containers. They can talk to each other unless you put some rules around it. So essentially, ability to isolate microservices in, an, in, an, in a shared network is important. The other piece is that it's not just a few containers. Imagine it's auto-scalable, right? And you saw the, you know, the demos in the morning. You know, things can auto-scale. You need to be able to maintain that, um, basically, a level of security isolation throughout the life cycle of the particular application. So that's something um, we see people asking us. The other pieces around, uh, I have different application performance requirements. For example, I have database applications, obviously. Some have a low, low uh, IOPS performance requirements, and other have higher IOPS performance requirements. And I have different types of storage backends that I have, maybe an SSD or, you know, uh, or, or, you know what different kinds of applications that I have, maybe hard disk that, that's on my, uh, on my laptop, on my, sorry, on my server. How do I, um, you know, differentiate a specific application requiring a higher performance of storage. I have, this, I have the hardware. I need to be able to specify this application requires this in, in this instance of, in this life cycle, life, life instance of that particular application. It, it, it can even vary, the same application could vary even if it's in a dev mode or in a production mode. Production mode you want to do this way, maybe in dev mode you want to do that way. So you want to be able to specify different um, ways to uh, manage, ways to specify that. The other piece is like the persistent storage. Obviously, you want to have persistent storage. That's the whole point of a sort of a database application, uh, but a database container, for example. Now, you want to be able to sp deploy the container anywhere in the cluster. You don't have to worry about, hey, my particular data store is only on this particular server, so I need to put the container on this server. What happens if the server goes down, for example? You, want to be, you don't have to worry about that. You should be able to specify, you should be able to run the containers anywhere in the cluster. So you know, we use the Ceph backend, for example, to be able to build, basically build a distributed um, database, a distributed database, you know, distributed storage, sorry, and then you replicate the, replicate the volumes across all of the servers. 
And then essentially, even if the one of the server goes down, you're able to bring up the container in another server, and you're able to run just fine. So you need to have the flexibility to be able to do that. The other piece is multi-tenancy. So multi-tenancy is obviously you say, well, this, it's not just service provider requirement. Maybe I have a, requ I have a requirement around, hey, I want to be able to create policies for, for Apple, you know, you want to be able to segregate the policies. I don't want a role-based access, right? I want to have this person only be, have visible to this policy. I don't want him to have one policy engine and then everybody sort of access the policy engine, right? I mean, policy for the application. So you should be able to specify, you know, sort of a domain, sort of say, tenancy that people can just have their view of the world. So there are also useful use cases around like um, duplicate IP addresses, overlapping IP addresses. Maybe you want to say, I want to be able to create a dev instance and a production instance or multiple dev instances for testing purposes for whatever reason uh, with the same IP address, for example. Then you should be able to um, do that as well. So that's sort of the, sort of the multi-tenancy use case. I'm sure there are more use cases um, around that. The other piece is that the automated lifecycle uh, cluster management. Uh, this is something that I think uh, you know, there was a good demo today, right, in the in the in the keynote, where you can you have this uh, auto forming uh, clusters, uh, Docker swarm clusters. But I'm talking about at a even more uh, a lower level, like you know, the box is just powered on. How do I get my OS on? How do I get my Docker engine on? Right, those kind of things. Like who who manages that? It's nice if it's all set up already, and then you are able to obviously connect to the swarm. It's awesome. It's just nice. It's very important, obviously. But then who manages sort of the, the life cycle of the actual bare metal nodes itself? So you want to be able to like load an OS, load a Docker engine, for example. And, and as you start placing containers, it's great. You know, obviously, they will be leveraging 1.12 to form a swarm cluster. And then when you add a new bare metal node, which is not even powered up, which is, which is powered up, obviously, but is not you know, loaded with any of the uh, OS and Docker engines, you want to be able to do that in an automated, automated fa fashion so that you are able to you know, grow the cluster you know, without manual intervention. So if a node goes down, you can, you can remove that from that cluster, which, is, which Docker is doing at that Docker level, but we know we could also look at it from a physical infrastructure perspective. The other part is like obviously the telemetry. I think we talked about this. I think there's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, essentially it becomes a, I used to actually start my uh, career in Cisco TAC where you know, I used to work on physical machines. So, you know, it's easier to, the guy says that this server is slow. Okay, great. What's the IP address? Let me trace the IP address from, you know, what, this, uh, this IP address to that IP address. Everything is static. Nothing moves. So it's awesome. But now, in this case, it is nothing is static, right? So you don't know. Um, these things come and go at a microsecond or, you know, seconds level. You don't, you don't want to be doing manually. You want to be able to... Um, monitor this and, 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 and troubleshoot it. If you have multiple microservices that are forming an application, maybe there's one uh, microservice being a bottleneck. Uh, I was watching uh, Adrian's, uh, Adrian Cockcroft uh, presentation a couple of days ago, on Friday actually, and he was talking about that. He, he has a new uh, open source project called Spigo, uh, you know, which kind of provides something very similar to that. You know, we think that you know, we, uh, a production application requirement, we, you really you need to be able to troubleshoot uh, bottleneck uh, microservices and then really ha narrow down real time. Because this has to be real time because you don't know when the particular microservice may get congested for whatever reason. So these are some of the requirements that, that, um, that uh, I have gathered from talking to customers. I'm sure there are a lot more, right? This is obviously a tip of the iceberg, and I need to fit in one, one single slide, right? So I need to make sure that I remove things that I, that, <laughs> that, that I can't fit in. But there's plenty more. I would love to have you guys uh, visit our booth and, and tell us what is your requirements are. Um, that, that's super important to be able to understand that part. We think that some of these requirements may not be all of them for you, but some of the requirements are very important to be able to, um, to achieve. So let's talk about like, our, the open source project, Contive, which, which tries to solve these problems. And so the, the, some of the uh, examples I talked about, some of the problem statement I talked about is what we try to solve with the Contive project. So they had a higher level. By the way, it's a Cisco-sponsored project, so was, you know, obviously there's other people participating as well. There's you know, uh, pulls from other people as well. I mean, we will really encourage you to to, uh, to uh, contribute to this project. 
and, and we'll, we'll, I'll spend some more time on this so you can, you can get a little bit more details on this, on this project. So at a high level, uh, we talked about this, right? The Docker Compose, for example, specifies how the application uh, is defined, how a microservice application is defined. But it does not talk about the requirements around the, how the operational characteristic of the application should be, like the runtime characteristic or the you know, ongoing characteristics. So the goal of uh, the Conti project is to create something called operational intent. Um, you know, it's, it's not a YAML file, it's just the point we're trying to say is that conceptually, you need to be able to specify the operational requirements uh, of an application at a runtime. And that's what, what I'm talking about here. And then once you specify the operational intent for the specific instance of the application, then you, you need to have an automated way to program the infrastructure. Either you want to create networks or you want to manage the storage like I just talked about, like whether you want to create snapshots, volumes, et cetera. You want to be able to automatically do that um, based on the requirement for the runtime, use, runtime instance of the application. So I just made up this, the, the, this piece on the right side, which is, you know, obviously you have somebody with the Docker Compose, right? You have a two-tier app here, web and a da database. And then you specify, you know, where you get the volumes, where you get the networks from, et cetera. But then, you know, you don't specify what security ports you want to do, what bandwidth you want to allocate for the web tier, what are the load bands you want to do. For database, maybe you want to allow these specific ports from only from web. Maybe you want to say, I want an SSD-based storage. You want, to, you want to say, I want to have IOPS requirements of this many IOPS per second, basically. Those things are not specified in the Docker Compose. So basically, we think this is sort of an add-on, so to say, um, to the Docker Compose. You definitely need the app intent, because that's sort of the, the developer you know, wave of the world. And then you also want to be able to specify some of the operational characteristics uh, of the application. So the way it works is that uh, you know, we, we, want, we want to basically, uh, obviously, the developer specifies Docker Compose and those kind of things to specify the application. We also provide an operator view uh, for this to be able to specify the operational intent. Uh, you know, you could argue the developer should specify some of the intent. That's perfectly fine. It doesn't matter. The point is that it's a, it's a you know, sort of a runtime characteristic of an application. Who provides that? You know, we don't really particularly uh, worry about it. So you need to be able to have the operational intent be specified, and then it should integrate into some of the clustering technologies that's out there, right? It, obviously, here, we are here at DockerCon, so we definitely integrate with Docker, uh, Docker Swarm, and you know, we have a very good uh, you know, deploy implementation of that. We also integrate with other, uh, other projects like you know, Kubernetes and other projects out there. The way you do it is you, you specify the intent and then you, you be integrate with these Docker, com, Docker swarms and application schedulers and then we enforce the policies in the actual nodes that are, or actual servers or switches, whatever that you have or you know, uh, those intentions. I remember like Seinfeld joke right, where they just say, you know, you go to the car rental company and says, I want, you know, do you have my reservation? Yes, I have the reservation. Where is my car? I don't have the car. The whole point of the reservation is to have the car. Same way here, you can specify whatever you want, but if you don't have the actual car, you know, it doesn't work. Same way here, you can specify your intentions, which may be good, well and good, but if you can't enforce it, then it's worth nothing. So here, what we do is we provide implementation of those policies. It's an open source project. We, it works on any uh, infrastructure. Um, yeah, obviously, um, you know, any infrastructure, you know, any, it's a, it runs on, a, basically it's a Docker network a net plugin, right, that goes into Docker plugin. So it, it runs as a plugin. So it could run on any infrastructure. Um, we do have some integration specific to Cisco infrastructure, and I will talk about it in a second. But again, it, it is an 80 to 90 percent you can run on any infrastructure. So for specifically for Docker integration, um, we integrate at a cluster level. Um, uh, you know, we want to go with the Swarm cluster, and we, we provide the policy management layer. So I mean, obviously, there are different components providing different, uh, uh, different services for, for the Swarm itself, um, for the cluster itself. But then we sort of provide the sort of the policy management layer for the infrastructure. At an at a individual host level, you know, we essentially enforce the policy, like I said. One is, per, uh, in, per, one is sort of specifying and others actually enforcing it. So we run alongside um, Docker. It's basically, it's a plugin, so essentially it replaces a native plugin. It's basically a driver, right? It replaces a native driver and it, it actually is implemented at, at, uh, at the kernel. So there are uh, four modules to the Conti project, open source project. You can go to github.io, uh, uh, contiv.github.io and look at it. But there are four projects to it. One is a network, which is basically provides you the network-related policies, 
And I have a slide that kind of gets into the, a little bit more details on that. We also have a storage specific policy that's you know, using a storage volume plugin. And then we have the cluster, which is sort of the, like I talked about, the lifecycle management of the cluster itself. And there's also the UI, which is basically provides you the dashboard view of things so that you can actually look at it in a more uh, manageable uh, case. From a network perspective, uh, you know, traditional uh, multi-tenancy, like we talked about the mother requirements, any type of connectivity, uh, layer two, layer three, overlay, um, uh, multi-tenancy, and also security policies, whitelist-based uh, rules. Like you, we automatically pull the whitelist from the Docker file. Like you know, expose if you have the expose commands in the in the Docker, you know, uh, uh, file uh, of the particular container, we take that information and automatically configure the policies. Automatically take that po uh, information from the Docker. You have some you have some information Docker compose or in the Docker file. We take that information and automatically. Um, uh, create the white, rule, white, white, white rules. Obviously, as an operator, you may want to put more rules or, or uh, more restrictions on a specific container. For example, the developer doesn't care. He says, I want a telnet port open. But I have worked in many cases where, you know, many IT organizations where they don't allow telnet anymore, right? So the developer may have exposed the port telnet port on the container for whatever reason. But as an operator, I can put additional rules on top of the operator uh, from the developer rules to create more rules, so we can do that. We talked about isolation, and we also do the monitoring that we talked about where you can actually uh, do live monitoring of different microservices and how it works. Um, so you can go to the, this is a, this is a net plugin. It's the plugin, a Docker plugin uh, that goes into Docker. And so you can go to this particular repository on GitHub to get the net plugin information. It is available, and we have customers using some of these things in, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's in semi-production, or, or I guess they're, they're calling it their production. And on storage, we have similar storage policies that you can have, obviously, the allocation, the snapshotting, the IOPS limiting I was talking about, persistent storage, which I think is a cool, cool feature. I think you have probably seen, like, similar uh, offerings from, like, Flocker, right? There's some, something very similar. Um, we have backend storage today. We are doing Ceph and, and, and NFS. You know, you, uh, you can imagine if we will expand that. We'll also manage the different disks. You know, if you have a server which has multiple disks on it, SSD and, and hard disk, and everything else, you can manage uh, the, that uh, aspects of it. It is a, called volume plugin, wall plugin, and it is available on GitHub. The other part is the cluster part of it. Again, we think this is sort of a value add just to bring up a bunch of servers automated the whole life cycle of the whole process. So we install the Docker UCP, you know, we install uh, Docker, it, all the Docker tools basically on top of the cluster. That way you don't have to go, if, if the UCP node dies, you know, we bring up another node and, and, or bring up the UCP on another node. So all of those things are automated. And, and again, you can, you can find that at the contiv.cluster uh, repository. The other piece is the operational manageability. I know that uh, so for everything is fully REST API, so you'll be able to program that uh, you know, through whatever means you do. Um, we also have like a management dashboard that you can use to manage the, uh, the operational aspects of the, the policy. So essentially, if you go to our uh, booth, you'll be able to see a demo of that particular thing. We actually have a, uh, maybe 10 to 12 demos in the booth, so all the things I talked about today, all the use cases, et cetera, you can go to our booth and be able to see a live demo. And uh, <clears throat> the other part I was talking about, this is sort of the only marketing, I guess, or only commercial slide, is that um, Conti works obviously with, with any product I mentioned before, but obviously we have done some special integration with Cisco products. Uh, for example, for ACI, which is a Cisco application-centric infrastructure product, which is an SDN product, um, we have integrated so that directly it ties it to the APIC policies. APIC has a policy model as well, so it directly ties into the APIC policy. So what's the use case? You have a use case where like the multi more, mo sorry, the multiple type of uh, mixed mode applications, right? So you have bare metal, you have VMs, and, and you have containers. You want to be able to manage them end to end. ACI allows you uh, full monitoring end to end, you know, meaning they can actually monitor the packet st statistics of the specific application all the way from the container to a bare metal to a VM end to end. So that's a useful feature um, that this particular, uh, I guess, joint solution would do. For the Nexus standalone, any network switches, we essentially do BGP based uh, connectivity update to the, uh, to the top of the rack switches. 
And then if you have UCS, Cisco UCS is a server, basically server product. And the benefit that it does, I guess, besides the automation capability that we, talk, we can definitely use, where you can bring up a cluster and all of those things automatically, it has the uh, VNIX that actually allows you to have a hardware level separation of different type classes of traffic, storage traffic versus uh, control traffic, uh, data traffic, um, between different tenants, different applications. So you can actually do a hardware level um, separation. Why is it useful? Uh, we, I was talking to a DOD customer, uh, Def Department of Defense customer. They really like the idea of uh, you know, ability to separate the traffic and be able to um, audit, aud auditable uh, way to do that. The other piece it can do is that if you're doing overlay solutions, like VXLAN based overlay, it can do offloading from that uh, NIC card. So if you have more questions, again, come to our booth and we can talk about it. So here are some of the use cases that I have um, on this topic, um, basically, you know, if you have, if you are, you know, struggling with trying to go to production with some of these use cases where you need a application performance predictability, you avoid port conflicts, you know, do service discovery, isolation, um, you know, basically scalable security policies. If you want an open source solution, you know, definitely it is fully open source, so you can definitely get it all open sourced. And obviously, if you have Cisco gear, then you want to integrate with Cisco gear, then it's great. To summarize, um, so we think that we automate infrastructure policies for at a microservices speed. So we are fully integrated with the Docker Compose and other ecosystem like that. And we fully automate our policies along with the microservices uh, model. So it's not an afterthought that you're going to do something for networking storage. It's actually inbuilt. And obviously, we talked about the security aspects and how we can do whitelisting, how we can do isolation, how we can do multi-tenancy. And the other big piece is that the ability to specify this policy will make your application more predictable. So going back to the analogy of the traffic intersection in Ethiopia, you know, imagine you have now rules where you have, a, you have a signals and you have a rules that a police car should go first and an ambulance should go first and a pedestrian should have right away. If you're interested, you know, stop by our booth. Obviously, that's an easy one. You can go to contive.github.io. We also have a Slack channel that you can join in and, and join the conversation. If you have any interest in sort of, you know, hey, I want a more assisted, uh, uh, I want to interact with the developers, I want to do an assisted beta, for example, then you can send an email to us. We'll be happy to assist. With that, I'm going to go turn it over to Ken. We'll, have, we'll take the Q&A at the end. That way it's easier. Go ahead, Ken. Thank you. Thanks, Balaji. So I'm the, um, the CTO for Cisco's cloud team, and part of what I want to make sure you guys understood when you walk out of here is that it's one thing to kind of go in a lab and like work on these developments and create them, but it's another thing to actually run a global cloud like Cisco does, and our partner clouds like DT and Telstra to kind of actually see these things in production, running systems, and actually working. And so um, that's what we plan on kind of talking about, you know, giving you more credibility of what this stuff is. Um, we're seeing a, a major shift like everyone here is seeing towards um, orchestration with, with Kubernetes kind of taking off and, and other, other projects following them along. Uh, I think a, a big part of this is around next generation architectures and development, and so no surprise with you guys being here um, at DockerCon. Um, the one thing that I think is, is really interesting is that this is like taking off much faster than any other technologies that we've worked with in the data center, and so it's... It's, it's, it's overtaking the VM, you know, VM was multi-year, you know, it took like eight years for VMware to kind of take off in the enterprise, and so this is like by far passing and surpassing that. Um, the other thing is that, you know, a couple years ago before I joined Cisco, there's only a few open source projects that, that Cisco was contributing to, and, and now we're really becoming much more open source centric at Cisco. Um, you can see just the explosion on the right. Um, we, you know, we talked about Conti. We also have things like um, FDIO, which is a, another uh, networking in the data plane to kind of replace the, the low-performing kind of Linux kernel that was never designed for routing with the real router. And so, you know, kind of taking our, our route processing and making it an open source component. Um, also, like, uh, I sponsored, like, uh, Mantle I.O. And, and Cisco Ship, so kind of more open source efforts to bring this community together and, and run better. We've also... Um, uh, been a big part of creating sort of a, a group around helping to define these standards and, and capabilities within cloud native. So we have the cloud, needing, uh, cloud native computing foundation. This is sort of the reference architecture we have there. We also um, have been a big part and involved with OCI, the open container.
project, um, where you kind of have the uh, container formatting is sort of the first, or the file format, sort of the first thing that we're working on there. But you can see that like networking and storage and kind of the operating system level are still all factor in to your architecture and the end-to-end -end design, which is important. And so when you, when you kind of think about, you know, what we're doing in Cloud Native Foundation and what Cisco is doing, we're kind of looking at, at this from a much broader kind of strategy than just containers and, and, and single company solutions. But we're kind of looking at this from a much larger ecosystem of capabilities that are needed to really run these types of services in production. And so obviously containerization is a big part of that. Um, distributed orchestration and management is a big part of that, but I think the biggest piece of all of this is sort of this move to microservices architectures, right? And when you think about that, it goes back to how do you compose your applications, right? How do you build a set of microservices? Because if you build them too small, you have nano services which are hard to manage and scale, right? And so it's, it's not easy to just take this, you know, like, like kind of Balaji mentioned, right? We took, you know, a physical server and made it a VM. And, and now we put like maybe instead of having one physical server, you would have now 20 VMs on a physical server. And now we're basically saying, let's take that VM and let's break it into multiple different services that make up this application. So now you might have like thousands of container services running on that same physical server. And the, the, the load of that is being taken by the network, right? And, and most servers don't have the kind of high speed networking that you need to really deliver the performance and the quality and the security that you're looking for. And so we're really trying to tackle that much bigger problem. One of the, um, the projects we've been working on is looking at, you know, when you look at the Cloud Native Foundation and, and different pieces that are needed to do that, you really have these different areas. Some of them are captured by the, by the foundation work, but some of them like proxy load balancing are not quite well understood yet. You know, Docker did some, some good announcements on that today that we've been working with them on. Um, the application, um, scheduling piece and how many different options you have there is another area that we've been working on. And so we've, we've done something called um, Mantle and SHIP to kind of address um, the main part of the, you know, the load balancing piece all the way down to the different provisioning options, trying to tie into your existing, uh, what I like to kind of call the existing DevOps model that enterprises use today with, you know, scripting type of tools like Puppet Chef, Ansible, um, to like some of the more, you know, I guess I'd call them more advanced um, types of um, infrastructure provisioning tools like Terraform. And there's other things we're working on to support as well. But a completely you know, open source approach, leveraging Docker, leveraging both Marathon and Kubernetes and Mesos and, and Docker Swarm now in our next release. And so kind of making it more of a, I guess you'd say a level open source playing field to allow you to kind of pick and choose what technologies work best for your application. If you're doing, doing data scientist type work, you may want the Mesos framework and some of the Mesos tools that we provide there for the data platform with the Elk and the Spark integration already there. If you're an application developer who doesn't care about the data but just wants to get the results of the analytics, then you could write your application and leverage Kubernetes to maybe orchestrate that or Docker Swarm, but then have the data information that you're looking for coming back to your application and making the, helping you make those decisions in real time to you know, kind of enhance and automate um, where you're going. I guess the, the key to this is that little, it's like only one box at the top that says ship, but that's sort of the, to me, the piece of this that's sort of still kind of um, magic in a lot of enterprises, right? How do you kind of orchestrate and, and define your services? How do you build your applications that can take advantage of all these cool underlying technologies that Docker and Kubernetes and, um, and other projects can provide you? And that's sort of that developer experience piece, and that's where we spent a lot of our time trying to help understand what, what developers need to really make their job a lot easier. Um, I felt like we've done a great job in our industry of making it easy for you know, orchestration and automation of the infrastructure layer, but we pushed kind of all that complexity to the developers and said, hey, you pick the network, you pick the type of storage you want, you pick the VLAN you want to deploy this onto, you pick your IP addresses that you want, or we just give them IP addresses and say, use these, right? Um, and, and in the end, it, there's a big gap there between what the business really needs and what they're able to get from that sort of a, a you know, self-service model. And so we try to really address that problem. And so with that, you know, we've, we're doing a lot in Mantle IO. Um, we, and we welcome you to join the community. It's, um, of, of the contributors to this, only about 20% a, a, about of them are, are my team. And so we've really, you know, we've, we've really opened this up and, 
you know, over 60 of these contributors belong to the community, right? They're not, and they're competitors of Cisco's, they're partners of Cisco's, they're customers of Cisco's, and they're, they're Cisco employees, but most of it is outside of Cisco. Um, it's, it kind of builds and brings all these different components together. It's a big part of where we're trying to take um, sort of the next evolution of the data center. And, and also the, with you know, an FBI and sort of the networking virtualization movement, also kind of the service provider space, and we're also working in the IoT space with like fog edge nodes being sort of microservice enabled from the beginning. And so you'll see a lot more coming from Cisco in this space, but please join, um, join us. We welcome your input and your involvement. Um, we ha we want to support open components and tools. We're not trying to lock it into any one set of vendors or choices. And so if you have a project you want to bring into this, we welcome it with open arms and would like you to join us. Um, if you'd like to know more, please meet me down at the Cisco booth at any time um, to this afternoon. Uh, we also have a meeting room if you want to meet and talk about some different things. And with that, I'll bring Apology back up for questions. And thank you all for your time. So if you have any questions, uh, we also have uh, Vipin Jin, who is actually the founder of the Conti project here. So uh, we're happy to answer any questions you have. There's a booth. We have like, what, 10, 15 demos there that uh, yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> you can talk to him. He said yes, we do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Go ahead. Loop, uh, from, you know, I'm assuming the mic is not working. Can you guys hear me at the back? There you go. Oh, okay, okay. So the question was, is there a feedback loop from Swarm back into Conti to assure the application SLAs? The application SLAs that we are talking about is network and storage. When we work with Swarm, we take over that functionality. I'm like, you know, I'm also one of the lead developers in the project. I'll be happy to talk about how that happens in details. But if you take over, the responsibility is yours completely and the feedback loop is uh, as such not needed. We do have an integration with Swarm where Swarm is free to schedule containers in the entire cluster wherever it is needed. And we'll make sure that policies and the SLAs follow the application wherever it gets scheduled. So uh, does that you know, answer your question? Okay. Yeah, I okay. think uh, also there's a piece that obviously we need to provide some other visibility back to the, the Docker UCP, for example. So, you know, I think eventually we will have a model where there's some sort of a sharing of information between different plugins. Right? This is not just with this Conti plugin, right? Eventually, every plugin has to have some sort of back-end information so the UCP has sort of the Uber information on everything. So you want, at the end of the day, you want to have an integrated system, not like separate uh, models. And just on top of that, right, with Mantle, we've integ we're integrating all of these components together. And the whole intention, there's like, like Vipin was saying, is that when you, once you've deployed your application and you start seeing how it actually performs for the first time in a production system, right, you're probably going to want to make changes to it. And if you want to make it more secure, you want to make it perform better, like, I think we understand what that feedback loop should look like, and we can just kind of make those changes on the fly. Now, if you want to be part of some approval process, that's easily easy to add that in as well and run through an approval chain. But I don't know many developers who would say, I don't want my app to do better. I'd rather you just wait and make it perform bad until I can look at it and tell you it's performing bad. So. Just a comment. So did you say that when you run Conti, you take over the scheduling part of Swarm? So no, 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 no. I, I don't think I said that. Okay. Swarm is the scheduler? Yeah, oh, sure. yes. The question was then, uh, um, does it take over the scheduling aspect of Swarm? Does Conti take over the scheduling aspect of Swarm, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, so that's a question. We do not. Okay. We want to make sure that, you know, scheduling is, there are plenty of schedulers. We don't want to take over that. There's Kubernetes, there's Swarm, there's Mesos. So, but everyone wants to build their own scheduler. Come on. What's <laughs> <laughs> so fun in that? So what we work is we, we work alongside those schedulers the parts that, you know, that defines the resource acquisition for networking and, and compute and, you know, uh, storage to be, to be working alongside the scheduler, which is what exactly I meant by policy follows the container. So scheduler is free to schedule the container anywhere in the cluster, but policy will get instantiated right then and there on the host where the container gets scheduled. Question. Uh, the question was, you know, uh, it seems, uh, I'm re paraphrasing you, uh, it seems like Conteve is mostly UI driven. Is there a way to 
you know, maybe uh, bring it together in an easy to use automated way um, or. Just so that it can be configuration managed. Like, uh, it could be configuration. I see, it could be version controlled. Okay, so first of all, um, UI uses the REST API that CLI and Go and Python clients use. So if you check out the open source code, you have Go and Python clients created for using Conti at a cluster wide level. So this means you are, uh, you are ready to you know, automate this into any of your uh, structure directly. Is it version control? Absolutely, because most, when you expose REST APIs, you have to make sure that it's not only backward compatible, but it's, it's completely version controlled. So you know that what version you're talking to Conti at a given point. And yes, the UI uses the same REST APIs to display whatever it does. There's absolutely no API which happens on the sideband uh, that Conti offers that UI uses you know, otherwise. I think that's a really important point too in that in, in these open source efforts, we're trying to address both the kind of the network administrator user who wants to log into a CLI and type commands, right? And at the same time address a developer who wants to just pull in an API con and kind of make it part of this compose file, right? And so we're trying to address both of those users and, and, and like Vip said, the key design there is it's API first design, not UI first, uh, you know, um, CLI first design. It's truly an abstraction with an API interface. Any other questions? Okay, I think the question was, you know, are security policies looking like IAM or AWS offers, uh, or, you know, is it custom? Um, first of all, it works on your laptop. You don't need to go to AWS to try these things out. Uh, which means that you can spin up a couple of VMs and try most of these policies to work between two VMs and containers. Of course, the performance is going to be whatever your laptop allows. So that's the start. Of course, you know, production is not going to be on laptop. Um, once you start putting it down into, let's say, your on-prem data center, then it will get applied on the host where container gets scheduled or it gets applied on the physical devices, depending on what you have underneath. Um, Bringing, bringing it back to the cloud itself, you can, if you can do it on your laptop, obviously you can do it on the cloud, which means you can s apply these policies on AWS VMs or anything else that you have, Azure or something else. Now, how does these policies look like? Are they looking close to, uh, you know, uh, think of that as category of policies. I don't want to zoom into technical details of every single one of them, but, you know, who defines how much bandwidth allocation is needed for application group, which is my production web application. And you know, is there one-to-one -one relationship between something that exists in AWS? I'm not 100% sure, but definitely you know, we're trying to be as comprehensive as possible. Security policies will look like VPCs and zones and ACL rules that are defined in AWS, that you can define in AWS in, in between VMs. So um, there are security policies, there are bandwidth policies, there are prioritization policies. You can say that, you know, this class of application is high priority, and we'll make sure that not only on the host, but in the network, it gets that, you know, uh, uh, behavior. And the way we've implemented Conti with Mantles, we're, we're definitely taking advantage of IAM and shared secrets. So we have HashiCorp's vault open source project is sort of like your shared secret store. And as you spin up services, we're automatically leveraging TLS with um, traffic, our load balancer, and SSL to encrypt all the traffic between services. And we're authenticating those services with shared secrets to make sure that this service was truly spun up by your application and not some man in the middle kind of attack that came out of some place you wouldn't expect the service to come out of. So there's a lot in the security space that come by the booth and we can talk for hours about all the things that we have to do <laughs> and are doing. Any other questions? All right. Okay. Uh, good you. lunch. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.